You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitated support meetings for families and individuals who've been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Helena is a 23-year-old detransitioned woman who's been writing and speaking extensively about her experience with gender identity. Helena began identifying as a transgender guy at the age of 15 and started taking testosterone at 18. She was 19 when she began her detransition and now describes herself on Twitter as a detransgender apostate. We discuss the complex landscape of youth gender identity culture and specifically look at the phenomenon of the gay trans guy. This is a female who identifies as a guy but is only attracted to males. Now, here is our conversation with Helena. Hi, Sasha. How are you? I'm well, Stella. How about yourself? I'm very good. Uh, It's late at night here, but um, I'm delighted to be here. (laughs) (laughs) Expanding the boundaries of gender as we speak. (laughs) With our special guest, Helena. Hi, Helena. (laughs) Hi. (laughs) Nice to have you. We're we're really, really looking forward to this conversation. I feel like it's long overdue. Um, And we are just so curious to get inside your mind and pick your brain about various issues that come up in the context of our work, in the context of a podcast, because people ask us questions, they request certain topics, and we are really hoping to... um, get your help in unpacking some interesting issues. So do you have a kind of um, elevator pitch version of your story, just in case (laughs) anyone listening doesn't know who you are, though I I think most of them will. I don't think everybody will. I think uh, you're very well known for your very insightful threads on Twitter. I don't think your story is as well known as as your insightful threads on Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that might be true. And, you know, I always think that I have an elevator pitch version of my story, and then I end up going on for 45 minutes. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, basically, I identified as trans as a teenager. It started around the time I was 15. And around the time I was 18, well, yeah, like a week or two after my 18th birthday, I went to an informed consent clinic and got a prescription for testosterone. And I was on testosterone for 17 months. Um, so the whole trans identity lasted like mm, little under five years. Um, so pretty big, I'm 23 now, pretty big portion of my life. And yeah, it was uh, pretty impactful. And I feel like the last few years, ever since I detransitioned in 2018, I've just been trying to not only understand what happened to me because it was so out of the blue. I never had any kind of gender dysphoria or gender issues as a kid, but then I just suddenly became completely obsessed with it to the point where I went on testosterone and used men's bathrooms and called myself a male name and all this kind of stuff. Never would have guessed that as a younger child. So I've been trying to unpack what happened to me. And that has led me to some broader questions about the culture, um, young people today, all these kinds of things. I think they're very intertwined. Um, mm-hmm. Could could I ask um, what what made you what, now, you know, you must be eight years later. What, what do you think flicked the switch that made you obsessed? And I know uh, so many people will want to know what made you flick the switch and maybe detransition. Do do you know what I mean? Like, do you have any defining thoughts around that? So in terms of actually starting to identify as trans, I I don't really see that as a switch. I see it as more of a gradual process, but it really relied on my social isolation um, and some pre-existing, I guess, emotional issues that I had been going through since childhood. Um, And then also my time spent in internet communities, specifically fandom and social justice communities online. And so it was was kind of a, it was a process that took anywhere from six months to a year 
until I first adopted a trans identity. And then the process from going from non-binary to a trans guy trying to go on testosterone, that took another year and a half, maybe two years as well. Um, but in terms of my detransitioning, that was more of a switch. I had some doubts and regrets for a few months. And then just one kind of event where my ex made a video montage of pictures of us since we met. And that just so happened to coincide with since I started testosterone, because we met just two days after I started testosterone. I saw this video montage of me just kind of like transforming, set to dramatic music. And just in my head, I was like, oh my effing God. Whoa, what am what I were you thinking? I, I was just like, I just watched myself go from like, looking kind of like myself, just like the weird gender version of myself with like the short hair and, you know, a binder and looking kind of weird to weird. I, th I thought I looked pretty weird. Um, going from looking like that, but still kind of looking like myself to having like this like sallow angular face and this like little mustache growing in and just like, just looking so unhappy, just gradually with every photo being more and more unhappy, looking more and more unhealthy. And I was just like, it just really, it broke the illusion for me because before I started testosterone, I had this feeling like this fantasy that it's going to be so amazing. I'm going to feel at one with myself, at one with my body. I'm going to, you know, finally feel like I can be authentic and be happy and be free and not feel so weighed down by my body and society and all this kind of stuff. And then I kind of carried that fantasy through even when I was on testosterone and my life sucked. I was just like, you know, I just need to keep going and just hold on. And maybe once I get top surgery, then I'll feel like that fantasy expects. But just seeing that montage of just every picture, I just look worse and more unhealthy and less like myself. It just, it was a huge slap in the face of reality. And that's just when the whole thing broke for me. And did your ex, did he plan it or she plan it? that this is going to kind of get her or was that just, was were they thinking this is going to be great no she was a trans man at this at the time too and when i cuz i i had my little internal mental breakdown i was just like <laughs> crying and sobbing and i'm sure she thought i'm just so like touched by this video montage but no i was just like i was having a freak out inside like total i can't even describe it like that feeling cuz you put so much into this trans identity and then to just all have it shattered in one moment. It's like, I was so overwhelmed. I've one of the most overwhelming experiences I've ever had in my life. Um, but I didn't verbalize any of that. I just cried and freaked out. And then a few weeks later is when I actually told her that I'm going to detransition. And she was very against it at the time. She eventually came around and detransitioned too, but she was pretty against it when I first told her. You said that you had been having some doubts before you watched this video montage. Were there other people in your life who you had confided to uh, those doubts in? Like, did anyone that cared about you and spent time with you know that you were having doubts? No. So I was pretty isolated. I just had my ex and I had my friend, my best friend from high school, but at the time we didn't live uh, together. She ended up moving to Chicago with me. Um, but at the time we weren't living together. So the only person I really saw consistently was my ex and then some of my coworkers. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't really verbalize this at all. I didn't type it anywhere online. I just like, it was very much in the back of my head. It was just kind of these feelings of like, like, when is this going to get better? When is this, I'm, I'm getting so tired. Like this is so exhausting, this co constant misery. And it just seems to get worse. When is it going to get better? This was supposed to be better. And then also just the feeling of, I don't want to pretend to be masculine anymore. I don't want to be wearing these stupid clothes. that don't fit my body. I just want to go back to wearing leggings and normal clothes. That I feel like I naturally gravitate towards, but I felt like I couldn't do that because I was trying to pass as a male. This is a really big point that I don't think everybody understands. I think a lot of people think all of these ROGD kids were always quite masculine and they are kind of being pushed to transition to male because we don't accept gender nonconformity. And of course, I think that's true for a slice of the population. But a lot of kids like 
like what you experienced, I think, are have convinced themselves that they have to suppress all of these natural tendencies in order to play the role and, and the persona that they have put mm-hmm. on. And I've heard you use the term curating your identity. This was years ago, but like that stuck with me because that was such a great description of a, a lot of things I've seen. And um, I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about like psychologically, what is it like to try and deny aspects of yourself for so long, things that felt natural to you before. I'm not talking about performing femininity because society tells you, but like just natural things about your, your personality and your, your mannerisms. Like, isn't that in and of itself kind of like creates a kind of dysphoria or something like, what was that like to just suppress so much? It was very like, the level of cognitive dissonance I had was incredible. I, I pretty much had to stop myself from thinking deeply in any way possible, whether that was like drinking or smoking weed or just numbing out in, in any way possible, like constantly just, I always had to have something playing in the background. I could never let myself think because these Mm -hmm. feelings that this is wrong would just always kind of creep in. And the, and these kind of questions about why am I forcing myself to do this? I don't like this. I don't like wearing these clothes. I don't like going to the men's room. I don't like putting this fake masculine body language onto my body when that's not really how I move in general. I don't like making my voice deeper. I don't like making up lies about myself so that other people will be, will more readily believe that I'm trans. I just, I don't want to be like that anymore. Um, so I, I kind of had to just shut off all thinking in any way possible. And so it was really hard. It was a really genuinely terrible time in my life because before I started testosterone, it was more cerebral. Like it was just kind of all in my head where one day I'm going to pass as male or whatever, and I'm going to be able to be a feminine gay male or whatever. But I just have to get through this period where, you know, I learn how to be a male first. So the society believes me just like really, really confused stuff that I was going through. Um, but then once I started testosterone I, and I started trying to pass as a male in the real world so that I could use the men's bathroom and not have people immediately say I'm a girl. Um, and so that people would believe me when I said that I'm a trans boy. Um, yeah, that, that was just a whole lot of suppressing myself. And remember when you were saying uh, it was very powerful when you just said it, I, I don't like, you know, acting like a masculine. I don't like, you know, pretending to be male. I, I You know what I mean? It was really distressing. you. Had I asked you there and then when you were in the middle of all that, would you have said, I love it? I love it. This is me. I think I would have. I would have said. No, I don't love it, but this is what I have to do to survive as a trans man in a cis normative society. It sounds about right. (sighs) Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, We we actually just interviewed Aaron Terrell, and and he was talking about 2017, uh, after he had been transitioning for six years, meeting some trans guys in 2017, being so excited that he was going to have so much in common with them, and then hearing them say stuff exactly like that, which is Mm -hmm. like, I don't actually want to do these things to myself, but in order to be believed in order for people to believe me that I'm trans, this is what I have to do. And this really speaks to um, adopting a certain kind of belief system. And I want to talk to you about that. You've spoken really eloquently in lots of interviews about the entire belief system that comes along with gender identity theory and even some of the social justice aspects of it. Um, And I want to maybe to kind of launch us off, I want to read a question that a parent submitted to us because I think this ties in. Okay. She says, have you explored ROGD and how social justice issues in the past year may play a role in trans identity among teenage girls? Sometimes I wonder if a cis white girl wants so much to be part of social justice movements. And since she can't identify as an African-American or be part of the BLM community, they might choose LGBT so they can immerse themselves in an oppressed group just to feel that sense of belonging and like they're really doing good in the world. What do you have to say about that? 
I mean, that really resonates with me. Um, I think there's, there's kind of like multiple ways that you can arrive at a trans identity. And I think there's definitely a lot of people that even I know who they were never part of the social justice thing. They were just mostly like, like dysphoric lesbians. And they were always kind of more like tomboys or masculine or whatever you want to call it. Um, and they just, just went straight to trans. Like, but I don't think I would have ever uh, landed on the trans label without thoroughly getting indoctrinated into the greater social justice worldview. And I think that is something that I've observed in a lot of other young girls. If I think back to when I was a teenager on Tumblr, I, very similar things. Like I would have friends who would not be social into social justice. They wouldn't be ever talking about dysphoria or being trans or anything like that. They would get a Tumblr account. And then a few months later, they would be trans because they adopted this like greater belief system about privilege and oppression and, and all this kind of stuff. And exactly like the parent asking the question said, you can't identify as a different race. You can't identify as a different sexuality really, because it, it just, if you're, if I'm, although I did go through a period where I thought I might be a lesbian, but you know, whatever, like if I'm a heterosexual woman, it's a lot harder for me to say that I'm a lesbian and to act like a lesbian because I don't want to be with women, but it's easier to say that I'm non-binary and just say that I have they, them pronouns, because then automatically you're not a cis het white girl. You're non-binary. You don't have to uh, deal with either that cis label or that het label because by being non-binary, you're neither of those. And then it always kind of starts out like that. At least it did for me and a lot of other girls that I know where it starts out with just, oh, I'm just going to try on these they, them pronouns and see how they feel. And then, oh, I'm just going to try on these Zer pronouns and see how they feel. And then just eventually after time of this being reaffirmed in such a circular way of being encouraged to explore your gender and reading things online where it's like, oh, if you feel like you're different than everybody else, it's probably because you're trans. Or if you feel like you've never been able to get along with girls, you're trans. If you've always hated your body, you're trans. If you've never felt like you would fit in, you're trans. Having this affirmed to you over and over and over, pushing you another step and another step and another step, I feel like it makes perfect sense that the belief in the gender identity system and the social justice system where in these communities, especially if you're isolated from the real world and your entire social life is online, and you, you start to believe that being a cis het white girl or being a white girl or being a cis girl or being a het girl, whatever, that that's all bad and you're responsible for all the bad in the world. And not only that, but you can't have an opinion on anything. Anytime you have an opinion on anything, you're going to get 10,000 rude people telling you to shut up. And this is your whole world. Then there's just so many incentives that push girls in this position to start identifying as non-binary and then going further and further down the rabbit hole. I think the drive during those years, particularly for like intellectually precocious, intelligent young women, is that we're you know you're supposed to be questioning things, expressing your opinion, you know, playing with ideas. And when that gets shut down in that way, you have to find a new way to channel that. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of times when you see these really social justice oriented, you know, Twitter accounts where it's like 15 year old girl FTM and they're like shouting people down, they're, they're, they're trying to channel an appropriate adolescent requirement, which is yeah, like, yeah. I'm supposed to be questioning the world. I'm supposed to be pushing back against boundaries. But I've also entered this community online, quote unquote, where there's only one way you're allowed to do that. Yeah. And it's if you're tearing down the cis heteronormative, whatever uh, mm -hmm. world. And I just think they're, they're in a very, they're in a tricky position. And, and I mean, not to go on a tangent, but I find it interesting when you see adults arguing with these young people on Twitter. Cause I'm like, they're just, they're just kids. Like they might say yeah. annoying things, but they're trying their best and they don't exactly know what they're saying because they're probably up to their eyeballs and ideology and not thinking clearly anymore. 
Yeah. And they, they really, they don't have the mental faculties to really, I mean, most adults don't, but especially 15 year olds, they don't have the mental faculties to really like evaluate everything that they see on social media and to cross check if everything is logically consistent that they believe and to really resist the social pressure and this fear of rejection, which I'm sure as, as you two know, teenagers are biologically more sensitive to social rejection than adults and children. Like it's just, it sets off alarm bells in their heads. So they don't have this, like this, you know, I don't know what people expect 15 year old girls to have some kind of stoic nature and just resist all of the social pressure when really everything in their biology is telling them not to do that. So I also think it's funny when people are arguing with 15 year olds online, it's just like, um, nature how, of the beast. yeah. How, how conscious would you have been when you were in the thick of it, of, of how much social justice was driving you? Were you were you completely? I, it's all about trans. It's all about trans, and you weren't quite tapped into the fact. Actually, it was maybe arguably all about social justice, and trans was a was a, a symptom of the social justice thing. Maybe I'm going too far there. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I don't think I would have. I don't think I really would have thought like about any of that at all. Because from my perspective, it was like. The social justice of it was kind of my first awakening into what I think about the world because yeah. before that I didn't have any opinions politically or otherwise. I just kind of was like a child, so I, I didn't I really think that about this kind of stuff as a kid. Yeah. It, the kind of the social awakening it was so exciting. Yeah. It was like oh my god, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so I guess like at that age, my brain was just primed to start doing that. And then I see this stuff online that there, there's, there explaining things about this about the world in this like very authoritative way that like this is correct everyone who's saying something else is completely wrong and they're wrong because they're hurting people and look at all this evidence that people are dying and getting killed and all of this and and we're right we have the answers we like as if we so had control excited. of the world yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's like if we had control of the world none of this death and destruction and blah 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 would be happening and so to wow. a preteen in primed for that desire to want to understand the world for the first time when that experience of understanding something new or thinking your own opinion is so exciting and so fresh. Um, it's just like, it's this perfect storm. And for me, I didn't think this is social justice. I thought this is the truth. Yeah. Like this is just the way the world works and wow. I understand it. So I wasn't like, is social justice driving my trans identity? I was just like, these things, I think they're all thoughts from me specifically and not influenced by anything else. And I just understand the world. And it just so happens that everyone I talk to on a regular basis understands the world in the exact same way. Um, <laughs> but and the, the gender for, stuff. Except for the adults, though, right? I mean, you're talking about a peer peer cohort, I think, online, on Tumblr. But I mean, teenagers are really primed to be sensitive about rejection from peers, not from adults. As yeah. Much. Yeah. Not from adults. And there's also, I mean, all the adults in this like social justice lore, it's like, I don't know how else to refer to it, but it's just kind of like the belief system or like the doctrine, whatever the adults are part of the old system. They believe in these yeah. old beliefs. They're like pre-revolutionary, dumb racists. We're, we're like the colonists, the uh, the adults. Like, colonizers. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the colonizers. Yeah. I think colonists has something to do with your large intestine. So I don't know if you're really? that. <laughs> colonist? Isn't it? Colon? I think you're I don't know. thinking of colitis. <laughs> or colonoscopy. <laughs> anyway, so sorry, the adults <laughs> are colonial, and the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the the teenagers are the new the new regime. Yeah, yeah. So when when adults would disagree with something, I would just it was just kind of like ah, you're never going to get it. You're just you're part of the old system. Just get out yeah. of my way. Okay, that's kind of the approach I had to it. Yeah. Okay. Boomer. Literally. Yeah. 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 I, I actually get it. I mean, I. I'm a, from a different generation, of course, but I went through a period of time where like, I, I thought I knew everything about social justice. Well, I didn't think of it as social justice, but like what really happens, you know? Yeah. And it's, it definitely has now that I'm, you know, a little bit beyond that, there's a conspiratorial flavor to a lot of this, which is that 
Most of what you see around you in reality was deliberately put up this way to prop up certain people, certain ideas, certain like systems, and you have to wake up to see through it. And there's a perfect parallel there to gender, you know, like, oh, you think that person's a male because they have a penis and a beard. Well, that's what they want you to think, you know, like there's almost like everything is this kind of conspiracy. And it really, I mean, I think it can really mess with your perception of reality. Absolutely. And going off of what you said, when you have this moment of waking up, it's like, you're, you're kind of incentivized to then become some form of trans. You were talking about waking up, like when you wake up to how everything is. Well, I think where you were going, I'll make a prediction. You tell me if I'm wrong. Okay. 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 If, if you realize that cis heteronormativity normativity is all made up to try and keep people in a certain kind of dynamic, you then go, oh my God, was I wrong about my gender all this time? Was I pushed into this? Did my parents try to make me wear dresses? Oh, they did. I must, I must question this. Like it sends you into a spiral of having to question everything. Is, is that the direction you were going? Yeah, that, that was definitely the direction I was going in. And there's also the, the feeling of, you know, when you wake up to this, you don't want to be the cishet white girl anymore because that's symbolic of these like old archaic structures that are oppressing people. And so you want to kind of move into that territory. And in a way, it's almost conscious, at least it was for me, of like, I don't want to be a cishet white girl anymore. So I'm mm-hmm. going to try on these they, them pronouns or I'm going to try on these Zezer pronouns. I actually did use that. Did um, you? I did. For like six months when I was you mean sixteen, Z did stuff. Yeah, yeah, Z did. <laughs> and did you? Uh, um, did 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 anybody take up on it, or did many people take up on it beyond online? No, not beyond online. Well, I think my my close group of friends that I had, they tried their best. Of course, they were all trans, also, so they really were earnestly trying their best. But I think we all kind of. We all were kind of, you know, on the surface, like, yeah, I'll use whatever pronouns you want to do. I'll use whatever name you want to do. But then my best friend started going by flame. And I remember I was like. As a pronoun or like as their first name? As a name. As a name. She, I think she went by like it itself pronouns and the name flame. And I was just like, you know, (laughs) obviously I couldn't say anything about it out loud. So I just kind of avoided using any of that. But I was like, that's kind of ridiculous. (laughs) <laughs> I think if I was young and I was because I'm pretty sure I would have gotten wrapped up in this I probably knowing my personality I would have prided myself on being really good at the pronouns I would have been like why oh, can't you? you guys use these it's so easy yeah. like I would have been yeah. so obnoxious I think <laughs> I, I'm that was kind of they haven't gone beyond pronouns so they say pronouns he him these are whatever but, but what, what about thou or something like what about changing the you do you know what I mean? Like they've, they've just confined it to the kind of he, him. Because you is gender neutral, so you don't need to do that. I know, but it is, uh, they have, you know, there is they, them. I don't know. I just, it's interesting that that's the only one. I suppose you can you're start right. it if you want. You can start Well, that if thou wants, if you don't mind. Oh, thou can start that if thou wantest to. Yeah. Sorry, okay. we went off on one there. Yeah, that's so interesting. No, that I you think we need to get the ACLU on the phone. Like, they need to start working on this. Really? ACL thou. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so this 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 was kind of a, a co- kind of a conscious choice on your part. Like, I don't want to be a cis hetero whatever girl. Um. And so, I mean, I find it interesting that with all the call out culture and all of the talk of appropriation, that there hasn't been a pushback within these communities to say, wait, you can't just use non-binary or or is there, are there people who say you can't just appropriate non-binary identities just because you want to escape your privilege or or, are people allowed freely to kind of come in and out of various identities as, as needed? Yeah, with the non-binary thing, I, I I think it's more free because 
it's almost kind of acknowledged that by being non-binary, that's a personal choice. Like they'll, they'll kind of say that like, oh, I was born non-binary. My gender identity is non-binary. But I feel like it's, it's kind of one of those things where it's like unspoken that when you're non-binary, you're kind of opting into it. Like you're, you're just using that. But then there's like, um, I don't know if people are familiar with the trans medicalist versus too cute discourse and debate, but um, the trans medicalist. I mean, I, I know, but tell, tell our audience. Yeah, the, the, the trans med, which means trans medicalist, that's basically the, the people who identify as trans who believe that their dysphoria is what makes them trans. And some even think like, you know, that there is, they have brain structures in their brain that make them more similar to the opposite sex or something like that. Um, so it's more of like, a, it's still a lot of like, ideology and kind of like mythology around it but it's different from the kind of gender ideology that we're talking about with the non-binaries so the trans medicalists they kind of view the non-binaries as like oh you can't just call yourself trans you can't say that you're the same thing as me just because you don't want to be a cishet white girl Mm -hmm. but within the the non-binary thing it's it's almost like it go it's it goes further than i don't want to be a cishet white girl it's it's like I can't be a cishet white girl because I'm awakened to all of this stuff. Therefore I can't be a cishet white girl because being a cishet white girl makes me a part of this like cis heteronormative system. So it's almost like by believing in the gender identity stuff, someone like me in the way that I saw it, I was like, because I believe in this stuff. And I also relate to all this stuff about how like, you know, if you feel different from other people, then you're trans, then I must be like, I have to be trans. So what's the too cute just to finish that up? Oh yeah. I'm not really sure what it stands for after all these years. It's like, I don't know what too cute means. And at this point I'm too afraid to ask, but it's, it's kind of like the, the foil to the trans medicalists. It's the gender ideology, non-binary other kin pronouns type of people. Mm. I noticed something. I I was following a couple of like, quote, gender experts who have online presences and YouTube channels and things like that. And there was a couple of people who were, you know, they're, they're making educational videos about how to discover your true gender and all this stuff. And what I found fascinating is I've seen this happen several times. Therapists who are doing this gender identity work end up themselves adopting some kind of a trans identity, which kind of speaks to what you're talking about. And I don't know if they're coming from the perspective of like, oh, I don't want to be part of that oppressive class of people. But I think it's, it's more the second thing, which is like, if you really believe that feeling different might indicate that you're trans, it's Mm. almost just a matter of time because I, I have yet to meet a human being who has not felt fundamentally different at some point you know, from their peers or people of their same sex. And I I also just am thinking about what you said before, like, if I don't get along with other girls, I might be trans. And it's like almost a feature of being an adolescent girl that you don't feel you get along with girls. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, I think that's very true. And I think everybody kind of feels exceptional in their own way, whether it's, you know, a lot of people get accused of narcissism for, you know, taking their gender identity so seriously. But I think at the end of the day, all of us are more familiar with ourselves than we are with other people. And we're going to see ourselves as being fundamentally different, even if that's kind of a like optical illusion a little bit because we're very similar to each other also. But I think anybody who, especially if you're spending a lot of time ruminating about yourself and you have this kind of belief system where it's like everyone needs to interrogate their gender identity to see where you fall on like the privilege system or where you fall on the masculinity, femininity system. If you're in that environment, I feel like anybody is like you said, in a matter of time going to start identifying as trans somehow, because we all feel unique because we are. So, and I feel like there's also in the gender identity belief system, there are a lot of sex stereotypes. Like if you look at what, like, okay, what do they say makes you not cis? It's not fitting in with people. It's feeling different. It's feeling like an outcast. It's, you know, if you, if you're 
des- designated female at birth, but you wore basketball shorts one time, that makes you trans. But then what do they say makes you a cis girl? It's if you conform to everything, if you love being a slave to the patriarchy, like all this kind of stuff. It's like <laughs> nobody... Not many Nobody's people. Nobody's going to volunteer yeah. for that. Yeah. Oh, I love being a slave to the patriarchy. I'll take yeah. it. Like and nobody's going to take that. And no woman, one hundred percent aligns with every single sex stereotype because, like, sex stereotypes themselves contradict each other. And like, there's there's no human being who one hundred percent fits this box of what a cis woman is. Mm-hmm. So I feel like, and like we said, and after. Any amount of time, anybody's going to start identifying as trans if they adopt these beliefs. I looked up too cute, so it's too cute to be too cute to be cis. <laughs> and it means that uh, gender dysphoria is not necessary to be trans. Yeah. 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 Too cute to be cis. Wow, yeah. there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, mm. I thought so too. <laughs> and there's just so much of that. Like if you go into these communities, it's like there's so much of talking badly about cis people. And they'll, you'll even get made fun of if you're if you're this is like this is how people become trans. It's like you're a cis girl trying to be an ally. Yeah. But all you see is people talking about how much cis people die, kill yourself, cis person, you suck, blah blah blah. And then you say, Hey, I'm here trying to be an ally. Why are you hating on cis people all the time? They'll be like, Shut up, cis person. You're stop making privileged. it about yourself. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so then it's like so then so- <laughs> that girl is going to realize if I want to be part of this conversation. If I want to have my voice heard, then I'm going to have to not be cis. Oh, and can you tell us a bit about, I think you've got such a real, what's the word? You really, really understand what's driving the the, the teenage girl more than most people. I really think you really nail it. And I kind of, I, every time you, you, you do those threads, I go, oh, she's got it. She's got it. Mm-hmm. But I'm mad to hear what your thinks, what your thoughts is about, you know, fandom and anime and, and the gay male thing that's really taken off among girls, especially, I suppose. Yeah, this one, this is one of those topics where it's like, it needs, you know, like a, a funding from the NIH or something. Like, it's like, there's so much to unpack there. And it's one of those things where people don't really make the connection until someone like me kind of starts to bring it up. But I think it's one of the greatest driving factors. And there's there's so many reasons why. But I think it it all will, stems will down to explain it first because I don't think people will know what we're talking about. We're talking, oh, okay. about, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. So fandom is if you think about someone who's a fan of any like media or artist or TV show, whatever, what have you, um, there that fan base for that media is called the fandom. So there will be like the Harry Potter fandom or the Naruto fandom or I don't know, the One Direction fandom. These are all online places. Pretty much, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess If, if you take the term completely literally, it's it doesn't have to be online. Like there'll be people who go to conventions or whatever, um, okay. or they'll start clubs at their schools or whatever, but a lot of it is online. Um, and something that's very common in these spaces, and I think this is another thing that plays a huge role in the trans phenomenon, is a concept called shipping which is basically when you have two characters or two even in real life people who you think that they, the idea of them being in a romantic relationship appeals to you. So like, for example, and a lot of these ships, that's what they're called. Like it's short for relationship, but a lot of these ships are male and male. So gay male. And this is a hugely popular thing. People think that this originated like five years ago, but no, there was people shipping the Beatles. In the 60s, there was girls writing fan fiction. They had zines about John Lennon and Paul McCartney getting dirty together. It's can a thing. Can you please share a link to this with us? We have to put that in the show notes, if you can find it. Yeah, I will try my best. I, I haven't <laughs> seen it in a while. I just remember that from when I was on Tumblr. And 
I started out in the classic rock fandom and I remember people would share like just photo sets of like just scanned things that they found in old magazines of like Paul and John are so cute together like this yeah this kind of stuff yeah it was a total thing I did not know this okay yeah Yeah. keep going it wasn't as mainstream obviously but there was definitely like a, a, a an energy around the the gay shipping all the way da- back to the Beatles and Lord knows maybe they were shipping gladiators together in ancient but, Rome like you you can't know the disciples but, um, I mean oh, what yeah the disciples <laughs> oh, Jesus gosh. and Peter and Paul <laughs> no I was I was gonna say Jesus and Judas because oh, Judas betrays exactly him it. and oh, so exactly it adds so much spice <laughs> what is your take on it um. Well, she hasn't even gotten to the good part <laughs> okay. yet. L- l- let's let Helena keep going. Okay, off, continue. So. <laughs> yeah, so so basically, shipping is probably the biggest part of fandom culture. There's all there's all sorts of stuff. Like there'll be people who are just fans of one particular character or person or whatever. But shipping is if if it's not the biggest thing about fandom culture, almost everyone in fandom culture has ships that they ship. And part of this is creating fan fictions, writing fan fictions, um, making art, talking about it. There's, there's group chats where people will talk specifically about this ship and they'll share different fantasies they have about the people in the ship being together. And most of the time when you, when you are in a fandom people's entire blog presence on Tumblr at least was dedicated to this ship. So I remember when I was a teenager, I was very into shipping and my biggest one for the longest time that I had was Draco and Harry from Harry Potter. And I was freaking obsessed. And yeah, there was a whole community around it. We would just talk about Draco and Harry being together and and all these different situations. Yeah. And a lot of the people that I knew in these fandom spaces, the young girls who were obsessed with these gay pairings were also trans. They identified as gay trans boys. And could I ask, so, so you'd be imagining Draco and Harry together and what, they're going to the shops or they're in bed? Or what are Draco and Harry doing when they're together? In these depends imaginations? on your mood. Okay. Depends on how you're feeling. Like sometimes... You know, it's like you're in the mood for a fan fiction where they're sitting at a coffee shop holding hands and gazing lovingly into each other's eyes. Sometimes you're in the mood for a fan fiction where it's like kinky, freaky, crazy stuff that 13 year old girls shouldn't know about. Um, and sometimes you're in the mood for a fan fiction where like Harry is actually like a lizard alien being from another galaxy and draco is a furry (laughs) (laughs) like there's there's infinite possibilities and it just kind of depends on your personal mood or what you're interested in your imagination is the only thing stopping you're standing between you and these fictions so um are there girls like thinking about this and like getting turned on and like learning yes. about self pleasure and stuff with these fan yes. fictions? Yes, one thousand percent. Um, it's very like the the erotica is a huge aspect of it for most people. For me, it was kind of secondary. Like I, I've I've always been a little bit more like squeamish about sex. I've never really been the type to be very into like like super graphic sexual stuff, but I did partake on occasion, but for me it was a bit secondary. Um, but I know for a lot of young girls, it's like they're constantly reading erotica, like all the time. Like it's a meme that you're like out with your family at lunch and you're sitting on your phone and your family's like, who are you texting? But you're actually reading some like filthy kink smut porn. That's a, with, that's with a pictures or just written word. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of iterations of this, but are yeah. the girls tending towards more just words? Um, when you're reading fan fiction, it's mostly words, but there's a lot of like art that's mm-hmm. uh, not safe for work. Yeah, it's um, which means like it's sexual. There's a lot of explicit art. There is. Um, Look at Stella. Probably not. She, her face is like 
<laughs> no, yeah. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I'm thinking loads of things. I'm thinking. Well, obviously, porn has been there. It was actually on the cave walls, like it's been there thousands and thousands of years. But it was pictures, and it was testosterone driven for so long. And um, I suppose my brain was racing there because I was. I've always been thinking the erotica is only going to come in with words with girls. That's how it's going to come in because the 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 visual stimuli of the testosterone is is so it's such a visual um it's very impacted by the visuals testosterone and then uh this is such a visual culture we're living in the combination of words and pictures for somebody with estrogen would be just perfect so i'm just kind of thinking so our day has come our our pornography has finally caught up that it's not just yeah. male it's female as well. And I'm just, that's what I was kind of intensely thinking about. I was like, okay, right. But it's it is, caught up. But what what do I think about this? I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's pretty different just the way it presents because, I mean, on the other hand, there are a lot of young women who watch regular porn, like videos and stuff. Um, but in terms of this, it's like, you know, it's, it's like a, a picture of an explicit act and then it's a drawing, but there's not a lot of, um, I guess video content. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, it's mostly just like a drawing and there'll be like, there's a lot of content that has sexual undertones, but it's not super explicit. Like it's not like all the, everything's all the so it's erotica more than pornography. Yeah. Yeah. I would say so. I mean, there's definitely pornographic drawings but there's yeah. more of like a spectrum where i feel like with men and boys it's like they just want to go watch the video of the people having sex so that they can masturbate yeah. Yeah. but with young girls or maybe women in general it's like the erotica at maybe at least for me the erotica was woven in it was complementary to like the romantic fantasy and it was almost like the erotica is there to complete the picture that i have in my head of the ship it's not just there for me to masturbate to you know and would gay males why would that be what's attractive to a girl well they're they're boys Stella I, I know yeah let's do it for me I do think it's I think it's more complicated than that yeah. even um I think one thing that kind of comes into play is the fact that it's fiction and a lot of the times in fiction you female characters are a lot of the times not as fleshed out as male characters are. So you can have like, you know, a story and the main male character is so relatable and cool. And then his best male friend is so relatable and cool, but then his female love interest is just kind of flat. Mm -hmm. So you, you'll have like girls where they, they love this character. They identify with this character. And then the, the male in the story is the other interesting character. And the female actually isn't very interesting. And then another piece to it, I think, is there's kind of like a a female female competition aspect to it, where it's like, and this I think especially plays into celebrities, but it can also play into when a girl develops a strong crush on a male character, um, where it's like you have this like this male character or celebrity who's the object of your affection. And you don't want him being with another female character or you don't want him having a girl in real life, girlfriend in real life, because you feel that like competition aspect and you feel jealous of that girl. So, Definitely. and and a lot of the times for, for young girls, it's like, you feel so insecure and you don't feel as pretty as the girl on the yeah. screen and these beautiful celebrity That's girls. It. Yeah. So the idea of him picking this, uh, some beautiful girl who isn't you, one, she's not you. Two, you feel like you could never be her. So it's just so much easier to get your fix of this That's romantic right. obsession that you have with this male out of a gay relationship, especially when the other male characters are just cooler. There's also, I mean, girls who are going through the gender dysphoria thing, they share a lot of disdain for pretty cool, popular girls around yeah. that time. So I think, uh, again, a normal thing that a lot of teenage girls experience, which is like hating on the popular girls or basic mm -hmm. bitches or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it, whatever generation says about it, gets channeled in a different way. And so there's really, a, um, I think, a great effort made to exclude all girl-related things from your 
interests, hobbies, like they just jump into the world of boys or at least their fantasy of what boy life looks like. Yeah, exactly. And I find it really interesting that, um, you know, uh, thinking about people like Angus Fox and some of the interesting things he's talked about, like there is this romanticization of what gay male relationships look like that aren't that accurate actually. And don't take into account that, you know, gay males are still males and they're men and they, they still have some of the traits, whether they're socialized or biological, it's not the argument here, but that actually a lot of these young FTMs would hate, like they are, they are not the fantasy that are, that they're drafted up to be in these fandoms, I think. And I mean, that's even more consequential when you think about the role that these, like, this projection onto these characters and then this projection onto this relationship, the obsession with the relationship, the obsession with the characters living vicariously the, vicariously through the characters and their relationships, how they are in your head. And then the fact that these men who you're basing your identity as a male off of are written by other teenage girls. And usually in these relationships, there's kind of a heterosexual relationship dynamic in these shipping relationships, not Mm -hmm. always strictly like stereotypically heterosexual, but there's usually kind of like, you know, the one that you as the girl with the ship kind of project onto. And then there's the other one who's kind of more, you know, a little bit more dominant, more, I guess, just typically male in personality. So there's the kind of masculine male and there's the feminine male. Yeah. Maybe not so much in terms of appearance because you can have, you know, it's so convoluted, dude. I but know. you can have like <laughs> like these these men in your fantasy can be like not you know gender stereotypic, but in the way that the relationship dynamic works, it's kind of like the fantasy if you had like a, a cool, pretty anime boyfriend. But you're also a boy. Are are girls who are kind of dabbling in this content, are they like interested in penises? are they drawing penises and like thinking about penises or is this much more, I don't want to use the word innocent, but is this different? Like, is this about genitals in any way, shape or form? Or is this more about like the romance and the fantasy of how this relationship between two men unfolds? Again, it depends on the person. Like for me, I mean, I was definitely, when I did read the erotica, like there's plenty of penis <laughs> in the story. Like it's very explicit in in all of the bodily functions, if you know what I mean. Like it's pretty explicit. Um, but that's there's also the romantic aspect of it. Um, as for art, there's not as much art that's like genital explicit or at least not, not that I saw maybe, but it also does exist. Like, trust me, it does exist. But, um, just from my personal experience, I kind of preferred like lightly erotic visual art, but not super explicit visual art, but for like the text-based erotica, the fan fictions, then it's like, yeah, it's, it's fully graphic. Can you, can you just talk about the inspiration slash mood boards slash Pinterest pages. You mentioned this on Twitter and I thought it was so brilliant and I don't remember the exact wording of your tweet, but can you just explain that a little bit? I don't, I remember this tweet and I remember telling you about it because there's so many things when I see you tweeting, I'm like, I have to tell her about this thing. (laughs) Um, So I really wanted to tell you about the mood boards, but yeah, uh, I don't remember what it was in reference to, but I think I remember kind of my general thoughts on it. So on Tumblr, I don't know if it still exists. I don't use Tumblr anymore. And I don't really go into these like teenage girls, trans spaces or anything. But um, there's this thing that used to be a thing called a mood board. And it's basically a collage, but it's digital. So it's like you on Tumblr, you can post up to, I think, eight pictures in one post. So you'll have like, or no, I think it's nine. Yeah. You can have like nine pictures in one post or something like that. And so they'll pick like a topic and then they'll find pretty pictures then put them all together and kind of like curate them into something that like art artfully visually represents the topic. Mm -hmm. And I think when we were talking about this on Twitter, we were talking about the, there'll be like trans boy or like FTM mood boards. And it'll be kind of like, it's supposed to be like an artistic representation of 
the the aesthetic of like a trans boy or something that's like relatable to a trans boy but usually it's like it's it's pictures of pretty scenery and it's pictures of cute boys and it's pictures of just pretty sparkly stuff and it's just it it strikes me as just another example of kind of projecting this like very feminized version of your fantasy of what it's like to be like a cute boy or the way you feel about cute boys because you like boys and kind of taking all of that and and mushing it together into this identity and you can really see that reflected when they make this kind of artistic content because it it very much looks like you know if a girl had a crush on a boy and made like a collage of him along with some pretty pictures that fit her aesthetic of, of what he represents to her. And it's like, I feel like there is for a lot of these girls, it's like, especially the ones who are into fandom and shipping, it's like this love affair with an imaginary version of yourself. Yeah. I think, I think what struck me about your tweet is you said something like, it's not lost on me that I would spend hours looking at, collages of pretty pictures and hot guys and that's how I knew I was a man yeah yeah and it's like oh wow and it's kind of like are there men making collages of like (laughs) cowboy boots and like tractors like you know I mean of course I know that's a ridiculous stereotype but I do think there's something in a way I mean it's so it's so innocent and sweet in a way to think that there's thousands of girls who are putting together these inspiration boards with attractive men and pretty things and, and thinking this proves that I'm really a guy. And there's something like, I really feel for these young women because they they're so easily made fun of by like a lot of the right wing media commentators and even people like, you know, the Blair Whites who are making fun of the SJW girls, but there's, there's something we have to be really, I don't know, I guess just cognizant of before we throw these kids under the bus, because they're, they're expressing like all these good things, which is creativity and hopefulness and like inspiration and fantasy and desires. And they're made fun of so much. And I feel like, gosh, you know, that's not going to help them move out of this. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's a lot of people who make fun of it. And and I kind of lightly make fun of it too, because I'm kind of making fun of myself. But at the end of the day, when you look at it from the perspective that a lot of these girls are just going to be affirmed in this, like this, this teenage girl fantasy of like just getting your wires crossed between what you're romantically and sexually attracted to and who you want to be and your insecurities and your fantasies of having a better life. And you're wanting to be someone else because you're a teenage girl. Like these wires are all getting crossed in a way that if it wasn't affirmed and if it wasn't attached to medicalization and if it wasn't attached to this authoritarian ideology, it would really be a pretty developmentally appropriate and pretty harmless at the end of the day, because eventually you're going to start having relationships. You're going to grow into yourself. You're going to figure it out. Um, I I quite like the idea of, you know, young girls, you know, reading about erotica and, you know, finding their way slowly but surely with mood boards and pretty boys. And there's something gorgeous about that if there wasn't, medicalization hanging over their head and them losing themselves in the midst of it. It could be lovely. Hey, it is lovely. Like, honestly, the, the, the phase of my life where I was on testosterone, I was trying to pass as a man that fucking sucked. I wouldn't wish that on anybody, Mm -hmm. but the phase where I was just on Tumblr making mood boards and edits and gifts and talking about my ships and reading fan fiction. Can I ask though, like, I know um, you you said Sasha, that a lot of people are are, are, uh, making fun of them. I I would say an awful lot of people are are indulging those girls and saying, oh yeah, you're really a boy. And yeah, rather than saying, honestly, kid, like, you're not a boy. You're making pretty pictures, and it's 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 frankly incredibly girlish what you're doing. Uh, yeah, uh, I wouldn't say that to a kid. <laughs> no, I'm saying nobody is saying that to a kid. I'm not saying that we should, but mm. I'm saying 
it's there's an awful lot of falseness. There's an awful the lot of are. like nodding along and saying, yeah, 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 as if this is very boyish when it's not boyish. There's there's a lot of fakery and it's dishonest. And I feel it's allowing teenage impressionable girls to live in a fool's paradise that mm. I'm not convinced helps them. It doesn't help them. And yeah, I, I wish it wasn't attached to the ideology because like it was very fun. Like that aspect of my life, like my, my life at school and my life at home, they sucked. But the part of my life where I got to go on Tumblr and I got to like indulge this, it was really fun and it was really energizing. And I do have really fond memories of it. Weirdly yeah. enough, I'm not into any of the fan fiction or anything like that. I don't think gay men are hot anymore. I grew out of that. But when I look back on it, it was so fun and energizing and I connected with so many other girls over it that I just wish there was a way to kind of experience that as weird as it sounds to outsiders. I wish there was a way to kind of do that experimenting and just being weird and indulging this this weird side of yourself because I feel like a lot of times girls aren't really allowed to indulge their their sexual and sensual parts of themselves in a way that doesn't feel threatening, like you're, you're going to be a slut or you're going to be taken advantage of. Like it's a, it's a really interesting way for girls to explore that without having to think about the implications for what kind of woman they are and, and their body and stuff like that. They're just, they're just away in their little fantasy world where they're Harry Potter and they're making out with Draco or whatever. Wow. Um, I just, I wish that there was <laughs> a way that girls could have that, but it's not also so damaging because obviously it led me down a really damaging road. And it also probably was a symptom of just my life not being very fulfilling and good, but Um, I have mixed feelings about it. Would there be many, uh, do you think girls at the time who, who did similar to you mood boards, Harry Potter and Draco, the whole lot and didn't go down the trans route? Yeah. Yeah. There was definitely girls like that. Um, I feel like most people that I knew and that I know now kind of like on the other side of it where they're not really partaking in that anymore. Um, most identified as some form of like non-binary or something like that, but never really took any steps beyond saying, you can call me she, they, um, they never really did anything else. Um, but there's also definitely just girls who don't identify as trans who are into this kind of stuff. But I think at some point, especially to like a certain personality type who has, who's having like a certain experience in her life. Um, the trans aspect, it's just right there. Like you're already identifying with this boy. You're identifying with this gay relationship. You're completely immersing yourself in it all the time. The trans identity is just right there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You almost get kind of absorbed by proximity or something since you're so yeah. close. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, I feel like we need to have you back on. Yeah. I'm still brimming with questions. I mean, particularly, per- perhaps if you come back, Helena, I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about um, how the relationship that young people have with their parents and the conflicts that can come out of their trans identification can impact a family. And you've been really insightful, I think, in helping parents understand how to lean in with a lot of love and try to work on the bond and think about Mm -hmm. what the underlying issues are rather than like volleying information back and forth and things like that. Because I, I think that's something that parents will hear your story and they'll have this oh my God, reaction. Like she reminds me a lot of my daughter. If only my daughter could listen to her talk about this, she'll snap out of it. And that's just not how it goes. Almost all the time, it doesn't go that way. So would you be willing to come back on and kind of chat with us about the family aspect of this? Yeah, I would love to. I would love to. There's even like, there's so much more that we could talk about with the the fandom and the internet stuff. I feel like I'm like a translator. Yeah. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm, or or like From I'm like Z. <laughs> or it's like 
<laughs> yeah, from Planet Z. Like I've been to this alternate dimension through like some kind of science portal, and yeah. I went in there. I got beaten up by DMT aliens, and now I'm back, and I'm here to tell you guys about the DMT aliens and what kind of fan fiction they read. So we we need to be, hear us. We yeah, really I'd do. love to. I'd love yeah. to. Well, I thank did. you for your translations today. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime, oh. literally. Absolutely okay. brilliant. Well, thank you, Helena. We'll, we'll have you back on for sure. Yeah, thank you, guys. It was fun. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is partially sponsored by RIME, Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics. RIME is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit RethinkIME.org to learn more. If you found value in our show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.